So tonight, though, guest speaker Carl Little, many of you know him. He's a author, critic, curator, and poet. Uh, Carl and I have worked on numerous art books together under the arm of the gallery. We have a publishing company called Marshall Wilkes, and I think we've worked on, oh, I don't know, quite a few oh. books, including yes. um, The Art of Francis Hamabi. We've done two books on William Irvin, Philip Fry, um, Philip Barter. I don't Jeffrey know. Becton. Jeffrey Becton. And in addition, Carl has probably worked on over 25 books or more. And now we are collaborating on a book on John Moore, artist John Moore. We're very excited for that. And he also has done a number of books with his brother, uh, David Little. And their new book is shortly going to be coming out, um, Paintings of Penobscot Bay. Or art, art, art of Penobscot Bay. The Art of Penobscot Bay. Anyway, yeah, I'm, Carl I'm, I'm is praying. extremely knowledgeable about the main art scene. He's been writing about it for years, and we're excited to hear him talk about the work of Emily Muir and her life. She was an incredible woman, and hopefully you'll get a real picture through this talk of the scope of her impact in the state of Maine. During a time where it was really, what, Carl? In the beer very beginning, you know, when there wasn't a lot going on in the state in terms of public consciousness of what was going on. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Carl. Welcome sure. very much. We're excited to have you. And Yep. Well, I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to start off actually by dedicating the, the talk tonight to, to Serge Liros, uh, who some of you may know had passed away in, on August 15th. Uh, he was a great fan of Emily Muir's work, and I know I showed it over the years in his Blue Hill Gallery. I, I hadn't learned of his passing until recently, and he was a, a you know a mainstay of the of the Blue Hill and Down East Maine art scene. So, but let's start with this portrait right here. I love this self portrait as painter. Um, Muir didn't paint, didn't uh, date the painting. She didn't date many of her paintings, so uh, particularly later on. So we have to guess often on sort of where, where they fit in in the timeline. I think she looks to be in her 80s, maybe, uh, with a group of her paintings behind her. And this is fun. Some of these you will see tonight, uh, some of the actual paintings that she depicts in the background there. She was born in 1904 and died in 2003 at age 99. And I think of it as kind of the ultimate modern lifespan, including, I think, five wars, the Great Depression, 9-11, enormous changes in technology and, and the world. Uh, uh, it, was, it was quite a life. Um, I met her sometime in the 1990s when I was invited to give a talk on William Muir sculpture at the Round Top Center of the Arts in, in Damariscotta. And I remember driving down to, to uh, Stonington and meeting her at her home. And she loaned me a scrapbook of clippings about Bill's work and career. And I also recall a, a, a wonderful house full of art. I mean, there, was, there were sculptures here and there and, and Emily's paintings. And uh, uh, it, it, it was great to, 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 actually, to actually meet her, be able to meet her. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I just reread uh, Emily Muir's autobiography, which was published by the Island Institute in 2002. The book carries her, carries you from her birth in Chicago to her later life in Stonington. And in between, there are early years in New York City, a very short stint at Vassar, which is kind of funny. She went to Vassar for a year and at commencement, um, she showed up wearing men's knickers and was promptly asked to leave the school. So she was actually kind of glad to do that. She wasn't quite her cup of tea. Uh, she later, soon later, met her husband, Bill, at the Art Students League. She worked at Macy's department store, which I didn't know or I had forgotten. Uh, she and Bill had many travels and adventures abroad. They made trips to the West Indies, South America, Russia and Scandinavia. And then, of course, for the latter part of her life, the last 50 or so years, she she was in Maine. 
Um, I just wanted to share a short passage from chapter one. She, here she's describing herself as a, as, as a young artist and it's kind of fun. So here's Emily Muir as a young artist. I spent hours on the floor lying on my stomach drawing pictures, pictures of animals, of people, of fantasies. We were taken to see Maud Adams in Peter Pan. The name was sheer magic. I lay on my stomach and drew pictures of Never Never Land and all the people in it and dreamt a dream where I walked up into the air simply by lifting one foot before the other, before the other quite touched the ground. And there was the earth and all its people below me. Later, I started to draw house plans. What was the fascination of arranging rooms? I do not know. But later, I drew almost as many house plans as pictures. With stars in my eyes, I showed my creations to my mother. That's very nice, dear, she said. What is it, a horse? <laughs> I, I just, I, I, I love that. Um, I wanted to mention that, yeah. So this photo of, of Bill and Emily was taken around 1943 when Bill was in the Navy during World War II. He enlisted at age 40. He started off in Portsmouth, then went to the Brunswick Naval Air Station, and finally to Mare Island Naval Shipyard in Vallejo, California, where he worked in a hospital for amputees and for victims of shell shock. Emily's parents were so impressed with Bill's enlisting that they gave him Russ Island, part of the archipelago that lies on Merchant Row between Stonington and Ilaho. I love this quote from John Marin writing about Stonington and its islands. He says, it seems that old man God, when he made this part of the earth, just took a shovel full of islands and let them drop. The Muirs were two peas in a pod. When Bill died after a heart operation in 1964, Emily was in despair. And I don't think she ever quite got over his death. I mean, she moved on, but it was, it was really devastating. He was just way too young. I did want to mention that their papers are in the Smithsonian Archives of American Art, donated by Emily in 1993 and 1996. Uh, next slide. And here are two uh, of Bill's public sculptures in Maine. The one on the left exemplifies his love of plant forms. It's uh, uh, in, in this case, a, a turn of the century hibiscus plant. Uh, as you can see the title turn of the century, this is from the Blue Hill Library. It sits outside the library there. Um, yeah, and I, and I, I had to look up the turn of the century. I didn't understand the title. Then I realized that it's actually, it, it's a very tall, this is from a botany uh, book, very tall, vigorous, sturdy, erect, but somewhat shrubby wood-based hibiscus hybrid cultivar that typically grows six to eight feet high and features dinner plate sized five-petaled hollyhock-like flowers. So there's your botany lesson for the evening. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I think it's wonderful and it does exemplify his love of plant forms. I took the photo on the right of Muir's stonecutter statue on the waterfront in Stonington uh, last week when I was down there. It pays tribute to the men who work the quarries on the islands off of Stonington. We should mention uh, that he and Emily were responsible for finding land for Haystack Mountain School of Crafts after it, it had decided to move from Liberty, Maine in 1960. Emily points out in her autobiography that the building of Deer Isle Bridge in 1938, of which she didn't really approve, um, helped in the decision to move the school to the coast. It just made the, the, the Deer Isle and Stonington much more accessible, obviously. Um, next slide. These are two more sculptures by, uh, by William Muir. These were part of the Emily Muir estate that came to the Maine Community Foundation after her death. And per Emily's request, we place these sculptures in public venues, including the University of Maine at Machias, which has a couple of his, of his sculptures. The year he died in 1964 at age 62, he had a huge show at the Sculpture Center in New York City. And I'm afraid that uh, his death kind of removed him from the radar of contemporary art uh, until he was rediscovered years later uh, with the help of Dennis Gleason, 
Karen and other other galleries here in here in Maine. I like this. People often asked Emily if her husband was related to the naturalist and environmentalist John Muir. She would reply, if he isn't, he should be. <laughs> uh, Carl, I think, too, that at his death, um, he had five, something like five major shows going on around the country, including one at the Whitney. Um, I don't know yeah. if you have any information on that, but I mean, he was really at a pinnacle point. Oh, he was. He was at the top star. of his game. Yeah. yeah. And it was uh, it was just really unfortunate. He had a heart problem. He went to Bangor for a consultation. Actually, his consultation was with the artist Nancy Manter's father, who was a doctor in Bangor, Dr. Oh, no Manter. Kidding. Yeah. And then he was sent down to Portland or Bo I think to Boston for the operation. And he sailed through it. And then the next minute they called and said, we've got a problem here. And he passed away. Yeah. You know, it's a, it, it probably probably would have been a fairly routine operation today, but mm -hmm. it wasn't. It was more. Well, more that of a, was what, 1964. Yeah. And well, yeah. It, it's also interesting as a couple working together, even though he focused mostly on sculpture, he was a accomplished painter as well. And, oh, yeah. And they often like when I said that we had the show on Arizona and New Mexico out West, they both would go on these trips and they both would paint sometimes often the same scene. And uh, a number of years ago, when we first started working with the estate, we had a show on their, their, um, their tropical works because. Right. Were, I remember that. They that was a great actually show. did marketing for a cruise cruise ship line. Yeah. And they created they said, dioramas uh, that, that were, yeah. Yeah, and it was it was actually it helped them, you know, it was their livelihood for a number of years, and helped them get through the the depression. I think. Uh, well, I um, I had read that um, when they got out of school and and um, the depression was, you know, imminent that yeah, yeah. Emily supported them by doing portraits. That's right. She started off as a portrait. Yeah, it, 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 during the depression, and she, <laughs> they just scraped by by the skin of their teeth. But then, when they were doing the cruise ship thing, they did spend a, a number of I don't know trips or whatever in Trinidad. They spent a fair amount of time there, and they have yeah. a whole body of work from Trinidad. And it was really interesting because when we worked with that show, we had I don't know, might have been back in 2012, something like that. Um, they both painted the same scene um, as it was a tropical scene. And it was really interesting to see their same scene interpreted by Emily and Bill. Oh, um, yeah. Fortunately, they were sold to somebody who took both of them. Oh, and, nice. And what she talks about a lot is when she was at the Art Students League is about how her one professor in particular really stressed painting with emotion. And some people say Bill was more accomplished technically, mm -hmm. and um, but she really painted with a lot of emotion. And I think it shows in the body of work that we're gonna be showing tonight, as well as some pieces that are in different collections that you've put together, Carl. Um, but she also said that she learned more from Bill Muir than anybody that she studied with at the Art Students League. And that for him, it really came from his soul and that he actually, you know, painted from that place. Um, she had a lot of admiration for his work. So it's interesting yeah. to see, uh, we don't have a lot of paintings in the estate that he did, but we do have some special bodies of, you know, watercolors and pastels, things like yeah. that. And we'll see one later on. I did want to mention, if you go to Emily Muir's Wikipedia page, there's a painting reproduced there. It's from the Smithsonian uh, uh, from 1935. It's called Orchard Street, and I'm almost sure it was it's it was painted as part of one of the, the like a, it was like a WPA program. They must mm -hmm. have been involved in that at one point, and it's a wonderful scene of like a a street scene with laundry hanging out and and people at a market and. Uh, it's it's it, it's a it's a wonderful painting. So they they got around and they Was that they were by by Bill or by Emily. By Emily. Yeah. Yeah. Nineteen thirty five. So let's go on. 
Speaking um, of portraits, yeah, speaking <laughs> of portraits. Adult with portraits, there yeah. are a number of portraits left in the estate that, that look like they were done maybe in the 1950s. Yeah. Uh, well, this is obviously Emily Muir painting Senator Margaret Chase Smith. Senator Smith came to visit uh, Muir's parents in Stonington in 1955. And I think as a result of the dinner that Emily cooked for her, for the Senator, she was asked to paint her official portrait for the Maine State House. In Time of My Life, her autobiography, she describes the saga of the portrait. She says, I captured both of the Senator's hands in action because her hands were never still. Smith is in a red dress with her signature red rose. This is, she's describing the painting with a glimpse of the Capitol Dome and a figure of liberty in the background. The Maine Arts Commission asked for 23 changes to the painting, all carefully listed, suggesting the Senator's hand should be in repose and that the Capitol Dome and Liberty figure were not appropriate to the subject. My response to the commission's request for changes was, go do it yourself. <laughs> so they did actually, they ended up commissioning somebody else to do a, the, the, the official portrait, the formal portrait for the State House. And, and Emily's portrait uh, became part of Mary uh, Margaret Chase Smith's private collection, which I guess it, it, it may be, I'm thinking that it may be at her, at, at you know, part of the, her home and uh, the, the the Margaret Chase uh, Smith Policy Center in Skowhegan, is it, or Waterville? Well, they have the Margaret Chase Smith Library, and that's what that's what of, I meant. Yeah, it's part of the library, and okay. they have something on their website about her home, which looks pretty interesting if you if you Google it. But I did look up about the the portrait she did, and they do have it, and they. Uh, one of their staff members uses it when school groups visit, and oh, she nice. says that it's it's um, they get the loudest reaction from school groups out of all the material they share with the Emily Muir port portrait. And um, oh, that's cool. Well, I guess they they ask the kids to, you know, she's holding a pen, and there's an I think there's an elephant in the scene, and um, we didn't have a picture of it. But, um, you know, they write about what's going on there. But anyway, the, the interesting that is that is used as an educational tool today. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's rejected, wonderful. That was rejected <laughs> for the state house. Um, yeah. And I'm assuming that this, this, the scene is maybe she's in, she's painting Smith in her house. It looks like. I mean, I, I, not... um, I, it looks like it to me, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it does look like her house. Let's look at another portrait uh, uh, that she did. So that. this one is a portrait of Margaret Chase Smith, but to me, it looks like maybe one of the studies that she might have done when she was working on the official um, commission. Yeah, I, I did want to mention that Chase was also instrumental in having Muir appointed to the Commission of Fine Arts under Eisenhower and then and then President Nixon. Uh, that commission later became the National Endowment for the Arts. She was the only woman on the commission, and she was, from her record of it, was pretty much ignored by everybody. But at one point, she suggested that a certain percentage of the cost of any new government buildings be reserved to enrich and beautify them. Uh, her suggestion fell on deaf ears, but she, she liked to think that it may have somehow inspired the Percent for Art program, which has been so successful here in Maine. I like to think that, too. It's... Uh, if it is, it's a wonderful part of her legacy, uh, and that maybe somebody was actually listening to her. Uh, she she has a wonderful description in her autobiography of the way the commission worked. I mean, it was so, you know, staid kind of white guys talking about art that they had no clue about. Um, and she was there, you know, as a living artist trying to give them advice. Um, but she did have crazy, a, and at that time, Carl, if she was living in Stonington, Maine, right, right, time, year round, she and she and her husband, um, but right. yeah, and very I have, involved in in D.C. I have an, another anecdote about her meeting Smith later on. Uh, she says, uh, "I saw Margaret Ch Chase Smith once at Westborough College, where she was honored as Woman of the Year in politics." And I was supposed to be woman of the year in art. 
frankly, I have no idea where they ever heard of me. I have an honorary doctorate from the University of Maine and a Hartman Award also. I'm very proud of my white velvet lined cape that is stored on the top shelf of the linen closet, but I never get a chance to wear it. I would like to become famous. It's just plain good business, but none of my six awards has done anything to swell my pocketbook. Even without fame, I am most proud to be listed as, as a designer of houses in Design International. Wow. Well, that was just kind of wonderful. Yeah. Hopefully later on, we can talk more about her. her Definitely. Uh, yeah. Excellent. And I, I did, I did want to, I did want to quickly mention too, that Robert Shetterly did, also did a portrait of Margaret Chase Smith for his Americans Who Tell the Truth series. And if you get a chance, go check it out. It's, it's very powerful. Uh, she, you know, she of course was, was probably most famous for the speech she made against Joe McCarthy uh, in the 50s there. Hmm. So this, this portrait is actually in the estate and we have it. So that's why yeah. I wanted to show it because I thought it was a- It's quite wonderful. Uh, well, it's a nice example of probably a study that she did for the official portrait and one of the, the many portraits she did. Um, so this mosaic is among Emily Muir's best known works as it is displayed near the entrance to the Farnsworth Art Museum. In her autobiography, she describes making the piece. Let me just, I have a very brief uh, description of this, which I think is kind of wonderful. Um, she writes, um, there aren't a lot of bright colored beaches on our coast, but there are surprising variations and subtle shades. There are subtle colors of tans, blacks, grays, and whites. I even find enough green stones for a lobster in one panel and golden yellow for bird beaks and legs. Those are part of the pebble mosaic panels at the Farnsworth Museum. So she literally collected all of these pebbles from the coast of Maine to make this mosaic. And they were there, you can see the birds with their with their slightly yellow legs there. And the lobster. And the lobster, yeah. I mean, it's really an amazing piece. Uh, uh, and I, I have no idea how long it took her. It must have taken her forever. It kind of reminds me in a way of the uh, stained glass uh, panes that uh, Ashley Bryan made out of sea glass that he found on the, on the shores of Little Cranberry Island. I mean, it's that kind of, uh, of inventiveness uh, you know, to to shape something out of these found objects, these 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 pieces, of these little these little pebbles, she calls them. Um, uh, it, it really is a remarkable remarkable work. Um, I did I, I did want to mention that in in his introduction to Muir's autobiography, that the, the then Farnsworth director Chris Crossman wrote, and I love this. She, he says, like her mosaic fisherman, Emily Muir is indomitable, heroic and timeless. So that was kind of nice. So this piece, uh, I think it's in the entrance over by Elm Street. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really the main entrance to the museum. Yeah, but... and it's, it's 28 inches by 148 inches long. So it's, it's a substantial piece and it's yeah. beautiful. I've seen it. Um, yeah. But what's kind of it... interesting, Carl, is that she found all of these stones in Maine because, you know, it reminds me of, um, a lot of the sidewalks you see in southern Spain, where they have they have tons and tons of these stones that were done by the um, the Ottoman Empire or during that era, I think, where they used all those. I mean, all the sidewalks are incredible. They're all like mosaics and stuff. But yeah. um, I would think well, it would have taken a fair amount of time to find these many pieces of stone in Maine. Well, she she may very well have been inspired too by mosaic work that she saw on one of her trips to Europe. That, that could very well be. I did want to mention that this is one of the, this piece was given to the Farnsworth by Elizabeth Noyce, uh, a Maine philanthropist who collected an amazing collection of Maine art during her lifetime and then basically bequeathed all of it to the Farnsworth, the Portland Museum, Maine Maritime and, 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 and other uh, other collections and institutions in Maine. It's, it so, was a great so gift. You don't think this was a commission by the Farnsworth? No, I don't believe so. No, it says gift of Elizabeth Noyce. So, yeah. I mean, 
No, I think this was done early on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, it gives a date, 1960 something. Yeah, well, yeah. pretty incredible. If you get a it chance is. to see it down at the Farnsworth. So now moving on to some of the um, artworks in the current show. Yeah. Called Soiree, which is inspired by this painting, Dinner Al Fresco. Yep. Yeah, I'm going to say that Muir painted a number of such occasions um, drawn, in this case, to the dynamics of the diners. I, I just love the way you know, there are these conversations going on and the waiters are, you know, one waiter's coming in, another waiter's taking an order. And there's just sort of this wonderful dynamic uh, to, 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 to the painting. And I, I, we have no idea when or where this painting was made. Um, maybe on one of her trips abroad. Feels Although very I'm, European to me. Yeah, and the, then I, but I was also thinking the style reminds me a little bit of, of some of the paintings she did of the Ames family, which we're going to be seeing later on. There's almost kind of a, a Renoir kind of softness uh, to to the way she's um, uh, rendered the figures. Um, and, but on the other hand, it could be a main restaurant too, you know, it could be a, a something that she spied. Sure. You know, back in the 60s, I don't think there were that many outdoor restaurants unless they were lobster shacks. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I mean, it definitely yeah. looks like a more cosmopolitan scene, yeah. possibly European, especially with the white the white jackets and the black ties and the cocktail dresses and the the waiters are in ties um, right yeah i and you know it's it, it's interesting it seems to me like a, a couple of the figures are very specific in their in in their likeness um and it would be wonderful if someone you know could identify them i mean i, I know that's kind of asking a lot but the particularly the figure on the left and then and then the woman on the right there, there's there's something very specific about the way they are painted. I mean, they're they they are portraits. Um, yeah. Well, I love this little part right here. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You don't see who she's actually. No, it's off camera. To. It's, it's, it's yeah. off camera. Yeah. Off -camera. yeah. <laughs> but yet, there's so many little scenes going on here. You know, because you've got like this couple in the back. Um, yeah. You know, obviously this couple. He's making his pitch, I guess, <laughs> getting ready to propose. Um, but this part I really love too. It does look like a Renoir painting. Um, you know, that yeah. section right there. Yeah. yeah. But it's... we don't know the date. And so, you know, it could be anywhere from the 1950s. It look, kind of looks style-wise 1960s in the, in the fashion. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's that would be a way to date it. Yeah, too. like the early 1960s, um, late 1950s, that kind of yeah. era right there. Um, yeah. Possibly it, France, you know. Yeah, I mean, it, it it calls for like almost like a forensic study. I mean, you could you know you you could even study the the jewelry. Now that I notice it, I mean. Oh yeah. Those, you know, were those specific designs from an era? Uh, yeah. It's interesting. All the ladies have earrings. Yeah. Right. No, I love this one too. I mean, this one is, uh, I think, kind of reflects her interest in cubist cubism, you know, with the, with the breaking up the, breaking up the background into these, into these geometric planes. And then this wonderful dynamic of the musicians and their instruments um, with the legs stretched out on the left and, and the, the heads, you know, turn to to their instruments. It's 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 a wonderful piece. It and is. Probably, you know, the the movement, Carl, and the legs is is probably the most. Ex it carries the whole thing. Right, and the simplicity of the black and white, uh, and then the sheet music and the and the yeah, it's it's really it's really quite wonderful. And again, it would be wonderful if the if someone knew who this trio was. Uh, there, there probably isn't enough to go on as far as features go, but it's a, it's it's a wonderful piece, and I just love the way it they kind of float there. There's no other, you know, they're they're part of the back. They're they're set on this background, and there there are no other details, you know, of their surroundings. Yeah, there's no there's, chairs. Right, there are no chairs. 
Oh. Yeah, I didn't notice that before. <laughs> well, that, yeah, great. Well, well, we're going to go on to the next slide. In the show uh, that we put together, um, Emily Muir, I mean, she's well known for a lot of her main paintings of lobstermen and the coast and, and things like that, much like the mosaic that's at the Farnsworth. But in the estate, there is a wide breadth of experimental works like this one called Dancing Horses. Um, and it turned out to be one of the most popular paintings in the show, e even though it's not signed. Um, maybe it looks a little Chagall-like. Um, that's, that's what I was thinking. It, it, it really felt a little bit like one of Mark Chagall's kind of surreal, surrealist, uh, you know, figures floating and uh, it's just very fanciful. Well, and so you kind of like start to imagine you know, because she is out in Stonington, Maine, what she was thinking about when she painted this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what she was on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about I that. Mean, Just, I, I don't know. I think it's interesting. Unfortunately, she's not here to ask. Um, yeah. We, we only this, have to guess. It's very dreamlike. Uh, and the figures, you know, the, 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 the almost like angelic figures flying along and, and the man in, in what looks like a suit. And then these horses and bird taking off. It's just, and again, and then again, there's a kind of a wonderful movement to it. They're all kind of going up, up, you know, up to the We're right. Very spiritual, you know, and, and optimistic. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's interesting it's, she chose horses and, um, you know, because you typically would think in a scene like this, it would be birds, but you know, flying horses, I think it's great. Why not? Yeah, <laughs> Pegasus. Yeah. Um, and this too, Carl, is another one that we've seen multiple times. This one, we have seen other paintings, these campfire scenes on the shore. I'm imagining this is the main shore. Um, yeah, this this is one of my favorite paintings in the show, in, in part because it brings back memories of of childhood beach picnics that I had when I was growing up on the south on the south shore of Long Island. Uh, but I did find a wonderful passage um, describing these these picnics uh, from her autobiography that I wanted to read. Um, she says, in Maine, picnics are the order of the day. Both Bill and Mother use any excuse to have a fire on the shore. In one place, a ledge is cracked off in a semicircular shape, forming a sort of arena where you can sit comfortably with your feet on the ground, no matter if you are already old. This becomes the picnic spot. So she she clearly they 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 clearly loved loved this this ritual. Uh, and then, and then the perspective here of looking out from underneath a wharf, I guess it looks like. Yeah, the uh, piling. It, 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 it adds a kind of a mystery to the whole thing. Um, but it's a wonderful evocation of a, of a night on a coast with a fire. It's really, really wonderful. So um, in, in the show too, there aren't a lot of um, main landscape paintings left in the estate. Uh, this is one of them, Setting Sun Over Stonington. And there's very, I mean, I, I'm not even sure how many paintings of Stonington are, but this is a really interesting perspective. You know. Yeah, and I, I was wondering how she got it. I mean, I, you know, it looks like it might have been taken from a, you know, maybe she made a sketch from a plane, you know, going over at some point. Um, because it's a very unusual perspective for her. I, I can't think of any other painting of hers that, 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 that's, that that's a bird's eye view like this. Um, and I did look at a map of Stonington to see if, you know, that looks like the harbor in the, in the background. And then I'm thinking these might be some of the small islands just off the harbor. And then I, that might be Crotch Island, which is a larger island that's kind of poking this in from one, the left. This one? Yeah, that one poking in from the left. But I could be completely, completely off. I, I, it would be good to have somebody who's familiar with Stonington, who, who might be able to ID the the the, the exact uh, exactly what we're looking at. Uh, because there's also a place called Greenhead, but I think that might be the 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 promontory that's a little closer to the harbor there, that's sticking out there. 
uh, that was a section of um, of Stonington. Well, it's kind it's, of an interesting painting too because these islands seem to be floating a little bit. So sometimes when you're looking at it, you're not sure if it's upside down for some reason. I don't know. It's, it gives you a um, kind of an interesting reality, I guess. Yeah, and then it and then it looks like it's a sailboat in the middle, right, Karen? Uh, the, this right here. The, yeah, the white looks like the white sails, which yeah, could be se seem like the right size for 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 their perspective, and uh, and then and then a house there. Oh yeah, and these the look point. like boats here, and even yeah, could possibly be a boat. Yeah, but again, there's a there's so some wonderful motion to it. I mean, as you say, the islands seem to be floating, and they could be floating in the sky as much as on the water. It feels like they are. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that's on purpose or not. Um, so there is another one here. Um, and these paintings that we're looking at are, are in the show now. If we come across one that's not, I'll let you know. But, but the gulls on the rock, this is a really interesting one. Yeah, this is a classic uh, view of the main coast, as are the next two that we're going to be seeing. And it, it prompts me to say that it would be fun to do a whole show of paintings of seagulls. Uh, they rarely get their due, but they've been painting painted so many times. Uh, I'm thinking of Rockwell Kent, um, James Fitzgerald, uh, who was a wonderful painter from Monhegan. He practically specialized in seagulls. Jamie Wyeth, um, and some very famous seagull paintings. And I think there's, there were some in his recent show at Dowling Walsh. And then Alison Hill, who's a, a, a painter who, who lives out there year round now, she's done a number of gulls too. I mean, there's there's so much, there's there's such a ubiquitous part of the of the of, of the landscape of Maine. Um, I love how she has kind of set them as sort of white accents against these gray, grayish rocks and this sort of overcast looks like sort of a sunset overcast day on the coast. Yeah, and you know what's interesting too, Carl, because you don't always think of the sea gulls in terms of composition, but but um, William Irvin uses seagulls quite a bit in his work. Oh, he does, he does, he yes. Does, but he says they're compositional elements, and so that's how he uses them. They're not just because they're seagulls. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, I think you could even say here that they're almost like musical notes. You know, you have three there, four there, two there. Well, they're creating a dynamic amongst them that supports the composition. It wouldn't be nearly as interesting without them. Yeah, you're right. And so, well, the, hmm? yeah, well, so this painting, uh, if you go on to the next slide, reminded me a lot of some of Marston Hartley's paintings. Oh, sorry. That's the that's the next one after that. Yeah, but but also yeah. Th th this is a uh, Hartley's um, it's um, edge of coast, Final Haven. I'm trying to see that. Yeah, I can't end see of it. storm, Final. End Haven. of storm. Sorry. Yeah, but the rocks are very similar, and I and and actually the 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 brushwork is very similar to some of some of Emily's work. I think she she definitely would have known Hartley's Hartley's work. And I think you can see that influence in, in some of her paintings very, very, very decidedly. Um, yeah. Well, I think a lot of the um, main artists were influenced by... Um... Oh, they are. I mean, Phil Barter is one who readily admits that it was Hartley that really got him going uh, to, to painting his home state. Uh, he had that wonderful anecdote of see, someone showing him an art book when he was in California, and there was a Hartley painting in it. And he went, "Oh my God, that you know, this is where I this is where I'm from." And and uh, and he 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 really set out to become sort of Hartley's, and you know to 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 take to further Hartley's vision of of Maine. Philip mm -hmm. did, and I think Emily does that too, in some of her paintings. Well, I think in these rocks here in particular with the, the darker outline is reminiscent. Yeah, exactly. Doing. So the next landscape we have is this crashing wave. Yeah, and again, you could see the Hartley in the, in the rocks in this one too. 
but this is uh, obviously a, another classic main motif. I mean, the, so many crashing waves in the in the in the, in the history of, of of the art of this of this state. You, Karen, you thought that this might be scudic. I think so. Yeah, uh, it certainly I'm feels that way. It, it does feel like scudic, but. Yeah, I mean, they you know, we're at it just about at any, if you go down there in a storm, the, 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 the waves come up over the rocks and actually Hartley painted that subject a couple of times. He was friends with Chenna with Hall and uh, Hall would drive him. He didn't drive, so he would, she would drive Hartley down to Scudic at the end of Scudic and he wouldn't bring any art supplies with him. He would just watch the waves and then he went back and painted some of the great wave paintings in the history of, of American art, really. Um, well, John Marin painted it. I mean, everybody's painted yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, Joel Babb. Uh, yeah, Sarah Farragher. There's, the Scudic is a is, is just a wonderful source of of, of, of subjects. Um, a lot of our uh, artists paint it too. Janice Anthony, Judy Velasco. Karen, Karen Marie Michelle has painted yeah. there. Philip Fry. Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, it's a popular it's, popular spot it but is why it's in, it's it's incredibly beautiful and it's the one place on the coast that's why i'm not that familiar with stonington's shoreline where they have the same kind of uh dynamic with the waves crashing on the rocks like they do of scudic because scudic is out on the peninsula you know yeah. out in the ocean and there's a lot of ledge uh yeah and there's a lot of ledge. open ledge yeah so the next one we have is called rocky coast which yeah, this one this one really feels like Deer Isle to me, although mm -hmm. it really could be any prospect down that way. Um, and I, I would just note that the brushwork here seems a little looser. Um, and I did want to mention that Muir actually first came to Deer Isle in 1914 as a 10 year old. And Who she did? and Bill, uh, Emily Muir. Oh, really? Yeah. She, her family came. Uh, after they had they had spent time in Vermont, but they decided to go to Maine, uh, and so they 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 there's a wonderful uh, uh, record in the in the autobiography of how they got to Maine every year in various ways because there was no Route One actually at the time, uh, not to mention I-95, um, and then they she and Bill moved to the island permanently year round in 1939, uh, and then. He went to war and stuff like that, but the, they spent really the rest of their lives there. And I, I did want to mention, speaking of Deer Isle, that Muir was an avid conservationist. She was a founding member of the Island Institute, and she worked with the Institute, the Nature Conservancy, Maine Coast Heritage Trust, the Stonington Conservation Commission, and other environmental organizations to preserve land in Maine. And I know there are a number of islands, including the island that uh, Muir's parents gave to Bill when he went to war. Russ Island, uh, Wreck Island, I think is another one uh, that 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 are conserved um, permanently. Um, she also was involved with the, it's I think it's called Crockett Cove Woods, where, where there's a nature trail. She helped set that up. So she really her love of Maine and the coast was translated into these into these acts of preservation. So this is cattails. This is another one of her faceted paintings. We have two examples of them coming up. Yeah, and I think here you really can call her a modernist. I mean, this has this has the feel of 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 some of the modernist painters of the of the of the of the of the twenties and thirties. Uh, this uh, uh, this uh, this faceted effect that she developed, uh, and I think this is in, later in her career. Um, probably like, like in the 70s, I want to say, um, where she started to break up the planes and and add these almost a, a, a almost fracturing the the, the landscape. Um, uh, it, it it it's kind of it's kind of wonderful what she's done here. This is another example of that same technique, Martian Sea. Yeah, and and here the, the 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 impression I get is almost as if you're looking through a, a window where there's rain coming down or something, you know. There's sort of a slightly blurring effect, a shimmering effect uh, that mm -hmm. she's developed um, in, in the painting. Uh, again, she's 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 very free. 
Uh, you can see, you know, like in the middle there, that the, you can see the impasto that she's added to, you know, to build up the paint. Um, sure. It's very, it's very inventive. Um, yeah. There's also a number of, of really sweet landscapes that we have in the um, estate. Um, yeah, and these bring to mind more impressionist, uh, mm. a more impressionist type of of of, uh, of approach to the landscape. Um, you know, a lot of uh, smaller brush strokes uh, to create the greater whole. Uh, yeah. I have no idea where this is. It could be, it, it sure looks like Maine because of all the rocks in the field. Um, it looks like Maine too. I mean, just based on the trees, but I love what she did behind the house. With, I'm assuming that's some kind of treescape back there. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I mean, now that I look at it, look at it, it almost looks like a breaking wave actually coming towards us. <laughs> <A> tsunami? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A tsunami. This um, is another sample of the same uh, technique that she was using. Uh, it's hard yeah. to date the work. It's hard to know how the development came about. You, you know, there's only I know, I know. What's the what's the evolution of her style? Where you know where 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 are these com things coming from? I think she was a great experimenter. Uh, there's so many different different ways that she approached the landscape and she you know and she could be very uh, uh, kind of bold uh, mm -hmm. in, 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 in her palette I mean that it looks like this sort of a pinkish to hue to the to the crab apple tree there on the right um, some of the colors are are, 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 are accentuated um, and then again there's sort of an overall impressionist quality to it um, I, I did want to point out to folks that you know she she almost always signed, when she signed her paintings, she signed them with just her, her first name, the Emily, which you can see here that with that wonderful large E and very simplified, but but uh, elegant um, uh, signature. Uh, John Wilmerding, the art historian, has a wonderful book about artist signatures where he reads a lot into them. Uh, the, the, the most famous example is the is Homer's uh, red signature for the fox hunt. And Wilmerding has his theory that, you know, that this was represented the, the it, it, he was, the red of the red of his signature matched the red of the fox, which is under attack by a group of crows. And that Homer was feeling attacked by the critics of his day. And I, he, it, it, it's kind of a far-fetched theory, but it's kind of wonderful. I think he could do something similar with with Emily, not necessarily here, but uh, there well, is something think, about an artist who- I, uh, I would think what would be challenging is where she and her husband had the same last name. You couldn't just put Muir because you wouldn't know which Muir oh. had done the work. Yeah, there you go. You, you know what I mean? And so and when you're yeah. writing about her, it's the same thing. If you're writing about William Muir and Emily Muir, you can't say Muir as you typically would when you're, you're going on about your writing. You have to start using the first name. Right. What, what I think is really nice about this one, going back to what she said about um, being at the, the um, Art Student League is, is painting the emotion of the scene, no matter what technique she was using, this one is just yes. full of energy. And this, this sky right here is, feels very Van Goghish to me, but the whole energy of everything going on with the trees and this, this vegetation down in here and the grass, um, she's she's really painting from the heart, you know, and I think that's what makes some of these. It's a little painting, 18, 18 by twenty eight, really special. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that what she said about emotion in painting because it's it's something that she carried throughout her life. She mentions it a couple of times in her autobiography how important yeah. it was for her to to bring that to 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 what she was painting. So she she did have a huge variety of subject matter. And I mean, she lived 99 years, devoted most of her life to making art. So you would have to experiment quite a lot. You'd, you'd be bored, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. To spend that many years just um, exploring art. And she, she, she also sculpted. She worked in clay, ceramics, wood. Um, but one of her other 
motifs was still life. Um, and this is a lovely one called Vase so dandy. And Window and painted totally different from the two, the several landscapes we just saw. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is a beautiful one with the poppies. And it mm -hmm. looks like da daffodils and, and, and maybe daisies in there. Yeah, and she wasn't really, I mean, obviously it's representational and you can tell what the scene is, but she wasn't really interested in realism. Yeah, if you go back to the last one, someone just pointed out that uh, the painting re re reminded them of Bonnard, Pierre Bonnard. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I and that so that would sort of be a neo impressionist or, or no post impressionist, uh, very much so. I, I I totally agree. Yeah, good call. Um, this is another still life. Yeah, and when you mentioned Van Gogh, uh, Karen. Here we go. <laughs> you can't really talk about sunflowers without thinking of him. This is a wonderful painting. I, I just like it's so full of energy. Uh, and happens to be one of my favorite subjects too for flowers. Well, so the mysterious part is in this portrait of her, is this that painting or a version of that painting, you know, in the background? Yeah, I think that's wonderful. Yeah, it's just interesting to see. We'll see a couple of these others too. Yeah. And this is another still life that's got a totally different uh, mood somber but not somber in a negative way i mean it's got both i love the background and the the tonality and the kind of the quietness of this one yeah yeah and she's she's just rendered the blossom so beautifully each one has its own kind of character and, the only yeah. thing i find interesting and curious about it is why she left so much space at the top and so little space at the bottom though i mean just the way she kind of situated it the bottom. yeah it's slightly tilted and yeah know, it's just interesting um, yeah philip koch says emily really did still life well <laughs> she nice well, she, did. She, she did she did she did um, so this ne next painting is kind of representative of, of some of the portrait work she did, which, which I would assume went on, she started it in the Depression and went on the rest of her life. Um, this era kind of feels like the 40s, 50s, maybe 60s. Uh, but this is the Ames family. It's called Ames Family Evening. And, and um, the Ames family lived next door to the Muirs, correct? That's I, right. I think they were a lobster fishing. They they were, and I, I have a I have another passage from her book to read, apropos this painting. Uh, she writes, "I did a number of portraits in oils and gradually got a few orders among the summer complaints, being summer people, but much of our time in Maine we are filling sketchbooks with views of this lovely island, or following the Ameses around, sketching them at work." Even, even setting up easels in their kitchen and painting them in watercolor. At the table, Bert at the stove, Walden in the blacksmith shop at the forge, driving the ox team, Cal in his peapod. We try to catch a bit of life as it must have been in the previous century. Apparently, they have no objections, even seem pleased and go about and go on about their business as though we weren't there. And Bert would say, we're having a smother. You'd better come in and mug up. So we're she really a what uh, a smother, which I think is a fog, like a you know a oh. foggy day, or and then a mug up is a you know to have a, a hot coffee, coffee or tea or something. Yeah, um, I, I I love that. Um, I wanted to mention also that the the Muirs were wonderful community people. And among other things, they invited local kids to come and swim in a saltwater pool they constructed on the shore near their house. And some of them learned to swim there, uh, which was great because some of the lobstermen didn't know how to swim. Uh, and so this this helped the, the next generation, you know, in their survival, future survival. Uh, I, I did want to mention an anecdote that um, Stefan Fitzgerald sent me recently. Uh, he's the son, he's a sculptor and the son of uh, Clark Fitzgerald. And he said, uh, he wrote, Emily and Bill Muir were like an aunt and uncle to us kids when I was young. We'd spend the day at their place swimming in their salt pond 
wander around the grounds looking at all the cool sculptures and eating whatever weird food they had to offer. I always loved going over there because they had as many handmade items in their house as we did in Castine. So it's, it's, it's kind of wonderful. And, 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 and I, I should say that the viewers were also part of the main art community. I mean, they would have known Clark Fitzgerald. They would have known Frank Amavi. You know, they would have known other artists in the area. Um, uh, you know, they were all, you know, trying to create work and not be distracted, but they also got together and it was, it was a very a lively social scene. And um, uh, yeah, so they, they really did. Oh. So are you, were you saying earlier that um, she just kind of was like a fly in the wall when she was painting them and they didn't mind? I mean, I know other yeah. artists have done that. Um, yeah. Yeah, they seem to enjoy it. <laughs> I, I, I think there are some photographers, I can't think of the name offhand, that they did the same thing. They were just like, you know. Yeah, follow them around. I, I just love that. Yeah, and, and yeah, so anyway, the, the Ames family paintings are special. Um, they are. In that, in that it's a documentary, whatever ones exist out there, of um, this era of life in Maine, um, you know. Yeah, you know, she says, she know. says, she says, we try to catch a bit of life as it must have been in the previous century. Yeah. I mean, the Ames family represented that. They were still very basic. She has another anecdote in the book about when she, when she brought electricity to their house and she asked the Ameses if they would like to have some electricity. And they were like, well, no, no, we're fine. And then they decided, well, yeah, let's, we'll, we'll, we'll get some electricity. So they had one socket. And then before you knew it, they had lines from the socket all through the house, <laughs> <laughs> bringing light to different rooms. And, and so they were very definitely from another, from another age. Um, there's somebody um, in the chat here that just said that um, they have several Emily Muir paintings and that she had used her full name on those paintings. And it, and it could, I just wanted to address that. I mean, I don't know, but I could speculate that, that um, she might have started using her, just the word Emily of her name later in her life. She yeah. did. And you're, we're, we're going to see a watercolor later on that has her full name in it. Yeah, uh, that that's dated from 1938, I think. So, I think it's something that she developed, and it may be because of what you said. I mean, just to differentiate herself from from her well, husband. Well, she either would have to use her full name. I don't know why she just went to Emily. Um, yeah, maybe because she was older, and and you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't yeah, only guess. But uh, this is another uh, painting, um, obviously of the wife and mother from the Ames family, the same white cat there and um, the same table and knitting. And that yeah, and you, had, you had mentioned that, that she started off as a, as a portraitist and she actually took a class in portraiture. This is her second year at the Art Students League with an artist named Winold Rice. And I, I came across this, this, this uh, fact that her classmates at the time included Ludwig Bemelmans, who some of you may know as he created the Madeline, you know, children's books, very famous children's books. And then another one of her classmates was Izumu Noguchi, who became really one of the most important sculptors of the 20th century. Um, and it, it's kind of amazing to think, it's almost like the stories you hear about Robert Henry's class, you know, where he had Hopper and, 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 and uh, uh, he had Hopper, and Rockwell Kent and Carl Springhorn and other painters in this, you know, in one class, all, you know, learning from the same teacher. Uh, I, I find that quite, quite amazing. It, it is quite amazing. I mean, to have been going to the Art Students League during that era. Yeah. It must have been incredible. And, and Emily, uh, that's how she met Bill. He was, a, he was going there too, but he was a, monitor, a sculpture monitor. And they met and fell in love, got married, yeah. and off they yeah. went. Yeah. yeah. I really have to recommend her autobiography because it just has so many wonderful little anecdotes. I'm pretty sure it's available online. I, I it, have a it copy is. Of it too, and I've had it for a while, but I can't seem to put it, my finger on it these days. But this is another Ames Brothers painting. You want to 
tell us. Yeah, and this one we, we threw in there because uh, just this past July, uh, this painting fetched twenty thousand dollars at a. Uh, at it a was Thomas... twenty four thousand. Oh, 24, sorry, 24,000 yeah. at the Thomaston Auction House. And that was a record for one of her paintings. I'm not sure whether that's a record for Thomaston or whether that's an overall record for her paintings. Um, but um, I, it's nice, nice to see her getting that kind of recognition from collectors. Um, I, I also wanted to mention that if you go online, one of her watercolors was featured on Antiques Roadshow back in 2008. You, you can see the not the episode, but you can see the listing of it. it it's a, it's a, it's a main landscape. So on yeah, this but one, it, you can see she signed it, Emily Muir. Oh yeah, so right she did. The corner. There you go. Yeah. Um, yep. Uh, we don't know the date, but it's 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 an interesting. I mean, definitely a Mars and Hartley inspired painting here too. Yeah, and this this kind of recalls the. Uh, brings to mind the Hartley paintings of the family in Nova Scotia that he lived with. Uh, there's those wonderful portraits of the of the fishermen, um, Adelard the Drowned, and, and and those paintings. It's very much in that line. They're 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 wonderfully uh, um, wonderfully painted. The faces, the expressions, the simplicity. They had a show at the Colby Art Museum of his work recently, and you could see some of them. I don't know if they're on display all the time or not, right? You know, at least, but uh, the show was really great. Yeah. So another another motif is farm life. I'm not sure where it was inspired. Whether some of it was, you know, the saltwater farms along the coast at the time. Um, but there's a number of paintings of cows in her estate. That's the favorite. Well, I, I, yeah, I mentioned to you, Karen, the other day that early in her life, before they her family started going to Maine, they 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 went to, they rented a place in Vermont. Uh, it was actually a farm, and in the autobiography, uh, she has this. She says, she says that this is the Wilder Farm. She says, I am a self I am self appointed cow herd. In the evening, I go down the lane, open the pasture gate, and bring the cows up to the barn. The task has its scary moments. Clumps of dark trees grow in the pasture. I am only five years old, and who knows what might jump out at you in the growing dusk. There is old walleye who has a habit of tossing her head as if she is about to charge. I am a little scared of her, but I think she only tosses her head to try to see around the horn that grows down over one eye. So I want, I'm wondering whether this isn't a memory of her, her life in Vermont. It certainly has that feeling. Uh, it could be, and I feel like a lot of these paintings, I mean, yes, she's influenced by all, all these other artists as all artists are, but some of these really feel like true Emily Muir um, work. Painting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, her thing. I think it's kind of curious, too. I wanted to mention that a number of, of artists who came to Maine in the 50s, uh, uh, like Alex Katz and Lois Dodd, also did cows. There was something about this subject that, uh, that the artists were drawn, drawn to. And there's actually a contemporary artist named Sharon Yates, who lives in Lubeck, who only does cows. That is her sole subject, and uh, she's she's done some wonderful uh, portraits. She goes right out in the field with them and paints them directly from nature. That's fascinating. But, yeah. This next one is, you know, definitely her thing. I mean, the the wild colors. Yeah, I, I love the I love the palette in this one. It's it's almost fauvist. It's 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 so. It's so it's so it's so made up. And actually, Karen, I found a little what I think is a reference to this painting uh, in in her autobiography. She's she, she's talking in the autobiography about trying to get it back into painting. I think she's been, you know, she's sort of the death of Bill and other things that are happening, and so she's desperate to sort of be creative again. And she gets she says, I pick up a pencil sketch I made somewhere between California and Maine some cows along the roadside with trees behind them. What's special about that? I try color, bright color, red tree trunks, green and yellow soil, blue road, black cows. I take a palette knife and spread the colors. 
and I'm, it sure looks like this painting. I, I think she's describing this painting, you know, the blue road, uh, the red tree trunks. Um, it's really a wonderful painting. It does sound like she's describing it. It's kind of interesting, the, the white tree. Yeah, that's kind of a, where's that coming from? I don't know. Um, yeah, I but I think she was really paid. sort of desperate at that point to kind of, you know, to do continue experimenting. The trees are very stylized, very unlike any other trees that she's ever done. You know, those rounded shapes, almost organic shapes. Yeah, and then as you say, that single white, it almost looks like a plume of smoke coming up. I was going to say a little, a little tornado or something. It does. And yeah. then all of the treetops really look ethereal. They do. Um, yeah. This next one's a little more um, finished, but it's beautiful. And it's the same with the colors. Yeah. Um, orange farmland. She, she did a lot of orange farm paintings. Yeah. I, I just love the pattern is here. Uh, she must have, you know, the perspective from some from a hillside somewhere with what looks like a river going through. Again, this I don't think this is Maine, but, um, uh, you know, I think she was, you know, she could also invent landscapes like the last one. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the ca the cows and the trees. I mean, this is something or, or working from a sketch from somewhere and just going, you know, being free with the way she the way she interpreted um, something she'd done earlier. Uh, yeah, I, I, and the clouds, wonderful clouds passing across the, the sky there. And uh, yeah, really well, wonderful. So to bring up the portrait again, the one we just looked at looks very much like this. That's it. Study for it. And this Definitely is the one. study for the other one, both behind yeah. her as well as the sunflower. So this portrait, this self-portrait is really pretty interesting. Um, yeah, it, it really is. It, I think I think it really belongs in a museum. I, I know you you said someone had purchased it, uh, but really it's uh, it, it's quite a it's quite a, it's quite an amazing self portrait. And then to have the sketch pad in her hand and um, it's, well, and it's also her age. I mean, she's clearly um, yeah age at this point, but yet her blue eyes are so piercing. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's what gets me about it is her blue eyes and and um, yeah, you know, being in front of her work. But the blue eyes just, I don't know, it's multi-dimensional to see them like that. Yeah, it's wonderful. She also painted other animals. And uh, this one is really wonderful. It's called Matisse Cats. Um, and the way she used the color, just going back through the last two or three paintings, the orange. Um, yeah, she liked orange. Uh, well, a lot of artists do, and I, I can see why, but she definitely did like orange. Oh, here's somebody has just, uh, someone, uh, Sheila Corbett has just noted that that painting of the soiree of the of the al fresco reminded her of the Astaku Inn in, in Northeast Harbor. Oh yeah, because <laughs> it has you know it has that porch and you know who knows that's a great call. It's a great place interesting to have popovers and and yeah and, and it, it it's it's just been bought yeah I don't know if folks know this but the Astaku Inn has been bought by the same people who bought the Claremont Hotel, and they are going to be it's going to be closed next next summer because they're going to be making major, uh, doing some major remodeling, uh, to the Astaku. So, uh, you'll have to. You'll have to go without uh, dining there next summer. It's a wonderful place to go. The view and go now before they quit. Okay. Yeah, or go now before they quit. Yeah, but I love this Matisse. I mean, obviously with that what, the wonderful decorative background, which is sort of a nod to to the great French painter. And this painting reminded me. If you go to the next slide, it reminded me so much of Dalla Vipkar. This is uh, well, this is a hooked rug that Dalla Vipkar designed and, and and created called Tiger and Leopard. Uh, but again, that kind of symmetry of the two the two creatures uh, uh, lying next to each other, uh, and this became a very popular design. Um, the family made it available, the, the Ipcar family made it available to other people who wanted to use it as a, as a design for, for rugs um, and other tapestry type uh, uh, creations. Um, but I think, uh, and we'll see this in a, in a, in a later painting, uh, that uh, 
there's definitely a kinship between uh, Emily Muir and, and Dalla Vipkar. You think so? I think so, yeah. And this is another one. Um, yeah, this one, I this painting I borrowed uh, for an exhibition this summer at the Gilly Museum in Southwest Harbor uh, called Avian Artistry. And I was just, the first time I saw this, I was just completely delighted. Uh, it's it's almost comical, uh, uh, but it's just, it's, it's also very inventive and, and funny and, and uh, yeah, it, three owls. It reminds me of the three musicians we just saw earlier. <laughs> yeah, but um, the, those eyebrows and the, and the, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's really wonderful. We are producing a catalog for this show, which should come out in the next couple of weeks. And um, oh, good. Uh, and the owls are next to the three musicians. Oh, perfect. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Um, this painting, um, yeah, this is the, one of the last ones we're going to look at, uh, from the show I, I, that's in the, yeah. and it, it just, it just goes back to her, her, um, she's brave about exploring things that are totally out of what you would consider would be her genre or whatever in, in terms of subject matter and even the way that, that she would paint it. It's called Summer's Dream. So I wanted to include it because very soon we're all gonna be having our summer's <laughs> dream. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we may be- into we, October and November and the rest we, of winter here in Maine. We may be turning to alcohol too, some of us. Well, whatever he's got in the bottle there, he needs to pass. Yeah. I, I think I, he reminds me a little bit, I mean, of almost like a contemporary version of Bacchus, you know, the god of wine, you know. Uh, but the landscape is so much like Ipcar. Uh, you, you know, that she loved that hide and seek of, of animals in the landscape. And yeah, I think it's totally delightful. I think that might be a meerkat in the foreground. I don't know why I think that skunk. Well, it is. And, you know, she did ceramics of that, the mural. Okay. There were a number of them in the estate when we first acquired it. Um, what's interesting, I never noticed the elephant before until we just started looking at it now because you focus on all the orange. Oh, yes. Look at that. I didn't even notice that. It's right in the middle of the painting. I know. I didn't notice it it's either. It's great. Now. Yeah, because it blends in so well. Yeah, it does. Yeah. So... It's a crazy painting. It is a crazy painting, but I like that she was daring and adventure. Yeah. And, and yeah. I think that's part of what we tried to do with this show is just kind of put together an eclectic mix of, of a journey in her imagination. Um, yeah. This next, next one, we do not have very many of her sculptures, but this is one that we do have uh, called Cityscape. It's a ceramic. Yeah, I think it's quite striking. I mean, just the uh, the negative space and the, 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 you know, the sense of the city with the stoops and the doorways. And I, I was reminded a little bit of uh, Louise Nevelson, uh, mm -hmm. some of her uh, wall relief pieces, uh, quite similar in the way they're assembled, almost like a collage. Uh, I think it's a pretty great piece. It is a pretty great piece. And uh, I know somebody who would really like it because they would put in, be adding their own little figurines to the little um, there you go. doorway and the pathway <laughs> and up on the, the different landings and just having fun. Yeah. Uh, this is a photograph you you sent us for the time. Yeah, I wanted to I wanted to mention, yeah, that she she gained you gained a lot of fame. Uh, she designed or remodeled about more than 40 houses um, on Deer Isle. Houses. Yeah, 45, 46. I've seen different numbers. That's why I just say more than 40 yeah. <laughs> to be on the safe side. But uh, this main, many of them were in, in the Crockett Cove area, which was land that she had she, her family owned. And she she created these things. Uh, and I just wanted to write, uh, and, I, I can, and I can tell you that this particular house, which is called the Falls at Crockett Cove, sold this past July for 1.5 million. Um, uh, the, the, the realtor's description likens it to a, a, a Frank Lloyd Wright design, which I think would have pleased Emily. But 
I wanted to read just a, a short passage where she talks about herself as an architect. Um, and, and the fact that she wasn't trained at all, she says, it never occurred to me that I had no training in architecture or engineering, nor did I even know anything about building materials. As far as I was concerned, there was wood, stone, old brick, the more natural the materials, the better. Actually, I was lucky not to have a lot of preconceived rules and regulations to cramp my thoughts as I had in painting. I just knew I could do something really special, convenient, livable, interesting, pleasing, a home that fit in the countryside with even a small surprise here and there, a recess for a potted plant, a built-in outdoor closet for propane tanks with a shortened door and a panel of cork floats at the top and bottom for air circulation, another closet for garden tools. The gas tank closet idea was later declared illegal, not because it was dangerous, but because were there a fire, the firefighters had to know where the gas tanks were and I had hidden. <laughs> So, I think know, it's so she, worth mentioning too that she also um, one of her goals was to include nature in the house. I mean, I think some of them were built right over granite that was in oh completely. And she house. she said she tried to leave every tree. She tried to do the minimal damage to the landscape itself to make them really fit into the landscape, and that was really one of the qualities uh, of, of her years designs. Go, Carl. There was a open house tour of some of the cottages. Mm. Unfortunately, I missed it, but I hope the folks down in Deer Isle will um, decide to do that again in the future. Yeah, really she took, to see what she, and she took great pride in that work. She, you know, as I, as I mentioned in an earlier quote there, I mean, one of her greatest claims was being, you know, honored in the design magazine or whatever it was. Uh, so she, you know, and it, this was later in her life. I mean, she really took it up and, um, but c clearly she was interested in architecture from an early age. Um, these last two slides we have are. Yeah, and these are also part of the Elizabeth Noyce bequest uh, to the Farnsworth. And both this painting and the next one will be featured in Art of the Penobscot Bay, my brother David's and my new book, which we're hoping will come out in November. This is her, a painting called Quarriers, uh, a group of, of, of uh, quarry workers, probably on, on Crotch Island, which was the major quarry off the coast of, uh, off the coast of, of Stonington. And, and as I mentioned, here she shows, she uses her full name. Well, it's E. Lansing uh, Muir, uh, 39. She also um, dated her, I don't know when she stopped dating the artwork. I know, I wish she hadn't stopped dating them. As, as you can tell from the way we've been talking tonight. Darn it, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next one is another watercolor. And, you know, Muir was a wonderful watercolor painter also. Uh, this one is the fish packing plant. Well, this uh, is William. I mean, William, sorry. Uh, and it's almost comical uh, the way that man is sort of inspecting the work of the women uh, who are cutting up the fish. Um, with their rubber aprons on. Um, this is at, at, at the time, one of the key industries on the coast of Maine uh, and is now almost entirely gone, I believe. Sardine, the sardine packing. Sar the sardine packing, yeah. This is yeah. fish packing. I don't know if they're talking sardines or, you know. I, am, I imagine, yeah, I imagine. Um, What's interesting is. Oh yeah, there you go. Muir always dated his work most often. And he also uses Bill instead of his, you know. Right, yeah. right. That's right. Look at that. Yeah. yeah. But most of the watercolors and things we have by him, he usually dated and, you know, had his full signature on it. Um, but you can see here, you know, Karen, you mentioned earlier that in one of the shows you had two paintings that they had done of the same motif. Uh, you could just see the connection between the two of them. They're, they're, you know, they're very stylized, style, style-wise. They're different, but they're, there's something, they had, they had a great sense of figure, a great sense of, uh, of, of line and, com and composition and, um, and color. And uh, I love this painting. Yeah, really, it's great. Really, really great. wonderful. 1938, uh, apparently yeah. around 1938, she was in her mid thirties. Uh, and then this wonderful quote from her autobiography, 
in a room full of canvases, a single painting speaks to you. Never mind that the artist died a hundred years ago. You have shared a moment with a friend. Art can be a lonely business, but it is enduring. Just, just, just wonderful. And, and I think it really expresses the, you know, how, how alive she was um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a person uh, you know, and a free spirit and an independent yeah. spirit. And um, I, I wanted to just to final to, to read to to finish this, as it were, before we take questions. This is the last her last two paragraphs of her autobiography. And I just I, I just wanted to share this with her. She was sort of responding to all the troubles that were taking up taking place in the world around the turn of the century in 2001 and things that happened around then. And she writes, well, I had one experience not too long ago that I would like to share. I had a large accumulation of paintings and sculpture of both Bill's and mine. I decided to turn two adjoining studios into a gallery for the summer. My home is a good mile east of Stonington along the north shore of the thoroughfare. I don't get much traffic down here that brings the many customers to the downtown galleries. I had a wine tasters opening one year to attract visitors and a couple came, strangers to me, and in talking with them, I found they were considering establishing a summer residence on the island. Right away, I thought I saw an opportunity to sell them a house or design one especially for them. I promptly suggested a visit to Crockett Cove or other special places I had designed. The next day, I took them to see some of them. On our return, they were in their car ready to depart. And he said, we love your houses and we love you too. This was so unexpected, so unusual, my jaw dropped open. This from a stranger. What a pleasant thing to say. I don't recall what I stammered in reply, but I took his hand to acknowledge his remark. I don't recall his next words, but he told me his wife taught him to open up. I will pass on that remark as a gift of the only wisdom I know. There, in a nutshell, was what this poor old militant world needed, good feeling among mankind. I just thought that was such a wonderful yeah, expression. Call. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she really thought about these things a lot. She I protested. One, uh, one quick question. Do you know when the her autobiography was written? Yeah, I think it was right around 2000. And it came out, uh, she died in 2003. It came out, I want to say, in 2002. I remember review, reviewing it for the Working Waterfront way back then. Um, yeah. Well, it was quite elderly when she wrote it. Well, she, it may have been something that she'd been working on. And I, think she sh and I think she showed it to Phil Conkling at the Island Institute and Peter Ralston. And they said, oh, we have to publish this. You know, this is just wonderful. But you can tell from that last section that that it comes right up to the present. Mm -hmm. she, she doesn't talk about 9-11, but she talks about the wars and things that are going on. And she was a she protested. She also wrote a lot of letters to the editor to in the Ellsworth American. Um, she was one of these people who really cared about the world, um, you know, as it expanded way beyond her, her home in Stonington. And yeah, quite amazing. Yeah. 